All right, man, peace. So there was a very big regular season game that just occurred between the Boston Celtics and the Golden State Warriors. Of course, they're going to talk about it, and I'm going to chime in. Ernie Johnson, Chuckster, Kenny, Shaq, on a night that when there were only two games and, and only... That was only one. One of them was really good. Yeah. Uh, you don't often have matchups like we had in game one of our TNT doubleheader on Thursday night. The Celtics with a 13-game winning streak. The Warriors winners of seven straight. How rare is that? It's just the fourth time in NBA history that teams have met with streaks of at least that length. And that's not all. Really? You had the Warriors, the NBA's best in a number of offensive categories, and the Celtics with the league's top defense. Look, I've mentioned this already in a previous video. The dynamic between the Golden State Warriors and the Boston Celtics, to me, is very reminiscent of the dynamic between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. Yeah, one guy who was extremely flashy, had, had an extreme amount of athleticism, charisma, but also made a lot of mistakes. But he had to be in there with somebody else who was special in order to have the mistakes that he made capitalized upon. Then you have a, a team like Boston Celtics who remind you a lot of Joe Frazier. They may start off slow in the game, but they're going to wear their opponent down with dogged determination, conditioning, and power. In their case, their power comes from their brain trust, that being Brad Stevens, um, the, the, the confidence of a Kyrie Irving, and the overall ability, the ability that they have to stick to their defensive principles, which very few teams in the NBA even have any defensive principles at all. Most of these teams are so young and, and inexperienced and oftentimes have such inept coaching that defense is the last of their concerns. Well, defense can accelerate your progress as a team, as we can see with the Boston Celtics. But once again, because of that Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier dynamic that I see between these two teams, I believe that if they meet in the finals, that it is going to be an extremely competitive finals. I don't know how long it's going to go, but it's going to be much more competitive than anything that we'll see between Golden State and Cleveland. And there was no doubt in Charles' mind which way this one would go. But they, they won 13 games in a row. Come on. I, I, no, I didn't say that. But I'm saying their they schedule has been very easy for them so far. Look, let me say this. When people use the excuse about the schedule, everybody plays almost an identical 82-game NBA schedule. When you win 13 out of your 15 games, now 14 out of your 16 games, you're a good team. And please remember that they are undermanned as well due to Gordon Hayward's uh, horrific injury. So, Charles just likes to say a lot of silly things sometimes. Uh, I think that it makes him feel a little, bit, a little bit smarter. And sometimes Charles does say some incisive things when it comes to basketball. But, no, you, you just have to give them credit. They've done a great job. They have an, they have an exceptional coach. And that is why Steve Kerr came out and said what he said. Because when you have understanding of what you're watching, when you have experience, you know, you know somebody is on the come up. You know when somebody's going to be a problem. It's like in boxing. When Keith Thurman talks about Errol Spence, when he was talking about him three years ago, he knew, he knew that he was going to have to see Spence eventually. You could tell. Champions could tell when the champion is on the rise. So that's why I've stated that Boston is one big man away. If they can find a way to swing a deal for a major big man who, with, with a high level of skill, you know, maybe they can try to, to utilize some of their, their draft picks. Of course, they're going to have to try to utilize some of their first-round draft picks to score somebody like a DeMarcus Cousins or Anthony Davis. Maybe New Orleans will, will be willing to let one of those guys go later on in the season if they're not doing as well as they would have, have hoped. We'll see, but that, that's all they're missing right now. I mean, unfortunately, New Orleans will probably try to get back a Jalen Brown or the, or the kid that they drafted this year. And, you know, Boston will have to figure out if it's worth it or if they want to wait until next year when they can get Gordon Hayward back and see how good he is before they can let go of one of those young assets. But they're definitely on their way. There's no doubt about that. They're not going to beat the Golden State Warriors. And they're not going to hold the Golden State Warriors to 94 points. I promise you that. Yeah, well, you know, it's great to sit on TV and make a lot of wild statements that when you're wrong, you just say, oh, well, I was wrong, you know. And, you know, guys, also not to digress, but you see that A for Auto Trader. Auto Trader is one of the major sponsors for TNT and for this show. And you'll oftentimes see this with most of these corporations. They will have an insignia or logo 
that is an allusion to their worship of the quote unquote pagan gods or or demonology. The A inside of the circle, which a lot of you brothers probably already know, is, is for Asmodeus, the demon of chaos or anarchy. All right. That's the same demon, by the way, that was mentioned in the book of Tobit. But you will oftentimes see logos with the A inside of the circle for Asmodeus. You'll see it a lot of times with a lot of the rock and roll groups, particularly a lot of the heavy metal groups. They'll use the A, the red A inside of the circle, which is for chaos or for the demon Asmodeus. Yeah. He was also mentioned that demon was also mentioned in that film that Denzel Washington did, The Fallen. If you guys remember, uh, the demon Asmodeus played a major part in that film. He was the antagonist in that film, The Fallen, where that demon was going around um, inhabiting the bodies of various people, possessing their bodies, and then committing you know, acts of murder, so on and so forth, until at the very end, uh, the demon possessed the body of Denzel. Well, so with uh, with that kind he of was right comments, to he did not hold them. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Kenny. They held them in What the hell is going on with Steph's hair? Oh, he's twisting it up. Steph is, you know, Steph is trying to get in touch with his quote unquote blackness. <laughs> That's the new end thing now. The, the, you know, the getting in touch with your blackness for a lot of the, the athletes is the new end thing in the last year, as I've stated, uh, since Muhammad Ali died, and a lot of these athletes have been encouraged to. You know, to embrace their so-called blackness and, and embrace their wokeism. You know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I just see oftentimes, as I've mentioned a few times already, many of the so-called light-skinned blacks, um, sometimes they try to compensate for their feeling of, of, of insecurity about their lighter, quote-unquote, skin tone by trying to out-black other blacks. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen it so many times. And, you know, it's really not necessary. Oh. I grow the locks. Oh, this kid here is playing fantastic. Oh, Jalen Brown. Jalen Brown reminds me so much of a young Scottie Pippen. I mean, he's on his way, but he reminds me a lot of Scottie Pippen. His length, his explosiveness, um, his dedication to defense. He's a great, great pickup for the Boston Celtics. And like I said, I'm sure that when Boston decides that they want to try to make a move for a highly skilled big man that... The other team involved is going to try to ask for either him or Jason Tatum. So they're going to have to decide if it's going to be worth it. That's how you got a player right there. Speaking of the locks. No steps a superstar, but that's how you got a player right there. Locks is a rap group, but speaking of them, shout out to Swiss Beats. I don't know him well, but I don't even know him. I'm now you see what Kenny Smith just did right there. Kenny Smith is that dude, 50 some years old, still trying to act hip. Still trying to act like he knows all the rap groups. First of all, Kenny Smith is damn near too old to have even known the locks. Like, the locks was out in the late 90s. You know, so we're going back 18 years. Kenny Smith was like 33, 34 years old when the locks came to prominence. So, I mean, Kenny Smith really should be talking more about guys like Slick Rick and Rakim and, and Big Daddy Kane. Point being is this. Kenny Smith, you know, he's one of those guys who, who thinks that being knowledgeable of a lot of the young music groups and acting like he knows people in the music industry makes him more hip or culturally relevant. Plus, he had that little daughter of his who's trying to be a, a R&B singer, uh, a.k.a. Uh, a musically talented thought, because that's all R&B singers are. But it, it, just, it just struck me that, first off, he tried to say that he barely knows Swiss Beats, and then he was forced to admit within the same sentence that he does not know him at all. So then why try to allege that you knew him for? Oh, I know. Uh, you know, he just graduated from Harvard. Did he really? Oh, yeah. oh, business school. school. Harvard, that's awesome. Harvard business school. I mean, Shout out to Swiss Beats. I've been yeah. like watching the Grand. He married to Alicia Keys. Yes, yes, he is. is. Oh, he's a nice guy. I met him one time. Yeah, younger dollar. Yeah. And, uh... Look, let me say congratulations to Swiss Beats if he did graduate from Harvard Business School, as Kenny Smith said. But at the end of the day, he had the money to attend the school. He had the prestige to be allowed in. And, um, you know, as I already stated, he could afford to pay the tuition. So I don't, I don't view that in as high an esteem as I would somebody who came from an impoverished background and was able to to succeed in that type of endeavor. But still, congratulations to him. And, uh, what the? Come on, man. That's not Here a comes Iguodala again. Mm. Oh, the smile. Oh, yeah, Marcus Smart. The smile, Got Marcus. The poster. Uh, Next time you get in the poster, smile. Ooh. Uh, Marcus Smart clearly was not expecting that from Andre Iguodala. Uh, Iguodala, you could tell, 
He does a great job of keeping himself in immaculate condition. And he also eats the right things. For him to have that, that same type of burst, being, I'm sure, damn near 35 years old, it's a testament to how well he treats his body. Part of a 12 nothing run, and they had a 17-point lead. But then the Celtics go on a 15-3 run to end the first oh. half. You know, good thing about the Celtics, they always play with energy. They, they will always have a chance to get back in the game. Yeah, look at the energy there, RJ. That's the point. When you play defense like that, you're always going to be in the game. Jalen Brown, after he got his shot blocked and stuck with it. Well, he, he, he has GE because they're a sponsor, but he's general election for them, for sure. 47 42 oh, at oh, the oh, half. Oh, Golden State oh. number one in the league in third quarter scoring, and they started the third quarter like they were going to put the uh, pedal to the metal again because they go 19 to 7 and open up a 17 point lead again. And then the Celtics go 19 to nothing on oh. Golden State. Finish that. Oh. I'll offer silently. Look, one of the things that hurts Golden State is Steph Curry making a lot of stupid fouls. I have a lot of love for the brother in regards to his accomplishments in, in the league, but he does a lot of stupid things on the court. And sometimes he goes into his too cool for school mode and he just makes a lot of silly errors on the basketball court. A lot of mental mistakes that cost his team in close games. I mean, let's be for real. He cost them in game seven against Cleveland. In, uh, to, in 2016, throwing behind the back passes out of bounds and a bunch of other dumb shit. Having a great year again. Jason Tatum. Do uh, you know who's playing well for the Celtics? Oh, good boy. Uh, oh. Baines. Yeah, he's There's not well. anyone that's not playing well. I know, Baines, but I'm saying Baines this is a, Yeah, Baines. Hey, Chuck, kill You know, that little caption or that little, that little moment there where they caught Steve Kerr on the sideline. Steve Kerr understands that the way that this team... When I say this team, I'm talking about the Boston Celtics. The way that they're being coached is going to present a lot of issues for them in the finals, both defensively and offensively, if they were to meet them there. All right. And, and right now, yes, we do have to start considering Boston as a serious uh, contender to get to the finals. I, I'm still picking Cleveland because of the dominance of a LeBron James. But right now, I have it at about 65% Cleveland, 35% Celtics, maybe 70-30. Cleveland to Celtics but um we'll see how it develops it's a very long season but Steve Kerr understands that the way that they're being coached they're going to present a lot of schematic problems both offensively and defensively that they won't have to worry about with Cleveland does, Ta- does Taylor remind you of Tyshawn Prince a little bit I don't know uh, if he's more athletic than Tyshawn mm, I don't know if he's more athletic Tyshawn was athletic nah, yeah. I'm going to tell you son, that kid is going to be fantastic Durant had 24 they got the lead and then Steph Curry uh, who did not have a good night shooting the ball 3 for 14 but they're up 81-77 but not for long Kyrie Irving who started the game with the mask took the mask off and oh back door so they cut the gap, and then this this can't happen right here. Yeah, okay, just well, did. It. No, you got to force that. I mean, I just you, did. You no, you got to force that out the other way. Marcus Smart, bad turnover right here into the hands of Curry, and then it's into the hands of Clay Thompson, and then oh, it's, it's mm-hmm. bye, bye. locked and loaded. 88-86 on them snipers right there, boy. Celtics tied the game on a couple of free throws by Irving, and then Kyrie. Tough shot. Did he did he draw the contact? I know he got the call, but usually the referees don't make that call. That's a tough call. Look, I know a lot of people are complaining that the Celtics got help from the referees. At the end of the day, it is more convenient for the NBA to push the Boston Celtics and prompt them upward. Remember, sports is entertainment. This is about narrative. Uh, it's a regular season game. They need they, they need another team in the East to be taken seriously as a contender. If they need to help the Celtics beat Golden State, that's what they're going to do. Remember, the narrative coming into this season was that the West is going to be very competitive and the East is, is just going to be uh, LeBron just going to coast through it again. So if they can help other teams gain validity in regards to uh, the perceptions of, of NBA fans, then that's what they're going to do. And at the end of the day, Golden State has to understand that in certain regular season games like this, yes, the refs are going to give the home team an advantage. Because with all the talent that Golden State has, most of these teams are going to need the help from the refs. Call. Usually they don't make that call. Calmly knocks them both down for the two-point lead. 
Now, Goldenstein, you said earlier, Chuck, you didn't like the shot by Durant. And I, I, I mean, you said, hey, it's for him. Okay. That's for him. It's, it's a good shot for him. With that amount of, you know, I think just missed it. Because you're trying to get a quick shot, so if you do miss Yeah, but I mean, when you set up a shot like that with, with 10 seconds left, if you're going to go for the tie, then why have him shoot a mid-range jump shot? Have him pump fake and go to the basket and go to the free throw line. He's an 88, 89% free throw shooter. It makes no sense for him to, to catch that on the baseline. Uh, all he had to do was pump fake. You already, you already know the guy, the defender, is going to be extremely aggressive to every fake. Throw up a pump fake and go to the basket. You're either going to get a... There's only, only one of three things going to happen. Either you're going to go to the basket and get a dunk or a layup. You're going to get fouled and go to the free throw line. Or you're going to get an and one. So... I just didn't see the feasibility of them designing a mid-range jump shot for Kevin Durant. I know he's seven feet. He can shoot over everybody. But if you're going to have him go for two, have him take it to the basket. That was the difference in the game with the Celtics getting more free throws. You do miss, you foul, and you have another possession at it. So they played the odds, lost. The uh, number one defensive team in the league holds the number one offensive team in the league to under 90. 92 to 88. Boston a winner over Golden State. Jalen Brown with 22. Horford again solid. 18 and 11. Uh, here's what the Warriors were saying after Boston ran its winning streak to 14, and the Warriors had their seven-game streak snapped. Yeah, 24 to 15. Uh, we committed nine more fouls. Um, it was actually 23. Um, the last one wasn't a foul. <laughs> But, you know, that's uh, petty on my part. Uh, but uh, we committed a lot of... You know, Steve Kerr be killing me when he get mad on the sideline. That man be cursing like a black dude, man. <laughs> man be like, you motherfuckers, man. I'm gonna catch you. I'm gonna catch your ass, man. <laughs> Faggot ass refs. A lot of silly fouls. Steph's third and fourth. Uh, changed the game, I thought. Um, and we kind of fell out of our rotation in the third quarter. Um, but they were just tougher and... Uh, smarter than we were tonight. I thought we played great defense and we rebounded well too. But it was the fouling, uh, I don't know, I think it's 38 to 19 or something. They doubled our total from the line. Tough to win that way. You seen it? I mean, at the end of the game, they set six free throws. But on the other end, I think we got to execute better on offensive end. Yeah, I mean, look, did they get some uh, preferential treatment from the refs down the stretch? Yeah, they did. But at the end, at the end of the day, Kyrie Irving put the pressure on the refs to make those calls by going to the basket. He didn't settle for for mid-range jump shots like you guys did. You guys decided that you were going to run Steph Curry off of three screens and take a thirty-foot shot. Uh, that, no, you guys decided to run a play where you want to pull up on a mid-range jump shot, uh, a quick turnaround mid-range jump shot with ten seconds left, when you easily could have just pumped fake and went to the basket. You know, you guys got to put the pressure on the refs if you want to get to the free throw line. Offensive end. I mean, we got some good looks too. You know, Steph and Clay missing wide open threes. Draymond. That's where we're at with the NBA in 2017. And good luck is is a is a three point shot, a wide open three. You know. You know when I was when, when I was going and watching the NBA, teams took it to the basket. They made the refs make those calls, and it's even easier to go to the basket today because your four man is not guarding the paint, looking to hit you upside the head with a forearm like it was back in the 90s. Now the four now the four man is out guarding the three point line. Draymond missed that wide open three. I think we got great looks, but we can't foul that much and expect to win. Missed shots, uh got out of sorts a little bit with foul trouble early in the second half that kinda of took me out of rhythm. Um but just couldn't sustain ourselves defensively uh when No, you mean you couldn't sustain yourself defensively because you had no discipline on defense, bro. Get it together, Steph. Uh, when they made a couple runs, they're playing the best right now in the East. And no, they playing the best in the NBA, brother. Uh, obviously, until they beat Cleveland, uh, who's done it three years in a row. Uh, we'll see, but I heard the weather's great here in June, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little shot at LeBron. There's no doubt in my mind that that was meant to be a little dig at LeBron, as I've stated before. When you watch that footage of Steph mocking LeBron's little celebration when he was working out, remember when Steph was at Harrison Barnes's uh, wedding and Kyrie Irving was there and Kyrie was laughing really hard? It was obvious that Kyrie's separation from Cleveland and you know the LeBron James experiment brought him and Steph a little closer in regards to um, their affinity for one another, kind of like you know the enemy of my enemy is my friend type thing. 
Not to say that Kyrie and Steph were ever enemies, but, you know, in the NBA you have rivalries. And guys know who their rivals are. And for the most part, I'm sure that they like to maintain, you know, a, a, a basic form of, of decorum, but also a little bit of distance because I, I, have to, I have to be able to do that guy, you know, I have to be able to do that guy up when I need to on the court. You don't want to be too cool with a lot of these guys. But I believe that Steph and Kyrie probably got a little cooler with each other in the aftermath of the LeBron James thing at that wedding, as I stated. I believe that Kyrie took Steph aside and said, look, this is, this is what went down. This is what's going down, and this is why I'm leaving. And this is why Steph has taken the opportunity to basically imply that Boston is the best team in that conference, and that's who they're going to face. And I mean, also, it's just obvious when you watch how they play, they're easily the best coach team in the East. It's not even close, really. So, uh, LeBron, LeBron likes to levy his share of subliminals. So, a lot of these other guys are starting to do it back at him. Especially since they see a lot of vulnerability in his team. Even though he hasn't shown much vulnerability. But his team has. Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, <laughs> Steph and the Warriors have their winning streak snapped. And uh, getting high marks from the Chuckster for uh, that, was, that one. That was... Uh, we don't really see them talk trash. I don't like that. We'll see them at the field if they get there. Now, Shaq, to your credit. Because we're going to be there, basically. At halftime. No shit, Kenny. We already, we already understand that. Halftime, you said. At halftime, you said, when they were down five, Boston will come back and win this game. Um, yeah, Shaq did say that. I give him credit. You know, every once in a while, his dumb ass actually says something correct. Um, so you you felt they had it all, all along. Chuckster... Did they prove something to you that that you needed to have proved to you tonight, coming back from 17 down to beat Golden State? They played very well tonight. Uh, first of all, they played well all season. Brad Stevens done a fantastic job, in my opinion. Uh, Kyrie is the front runner for MVP. They- well, I will put Kyrie right there with James Harden. Right now, at this point, it's very, very early in the season, obviously, but I have to put Kyrie right there with James Harden. Of course, Kyrie's numbers are nowhere near James Harden's, but... He's asked to do something different in their offense than James Harden is asked to do. So we, we have to recognize that sometimes, you know, especially in the last few years, people have gotten a little too caught up in, in stats, particularly last year with Westbrook, that they forget to understand that the MVP of the, of the league is really the best player on the best team. All right. That's really how it's always been for the most part. You know, if, and, and if he's not on the best team, he normally has to be on one of the top two or three teams to get the MVP. They keep winning. Now, you know, if, if James Harden and the Rockets continue to win how they've been winning, if they win 55-plus games this year, they're probably going to give it to James because he finished second in MVP voting like two of the last three years. So they, they're eventually they are going to give it to James Harden, even though I've already stated, look, um, James has to show me a lot, especially coming off of the, his last couple of playoffs. He has to show me a lot to get the MVP this year. He has to show me a hell of a lot, man. Like he has to average, he has to he, he has to average. He has to give me something like what Westbrook gave me last year, but but also win fifty five games instead of forty five. Like he has to win a good fifty five or more games for me to consider him. But right now, I would I would give him a slight, slight, slight edge over Kyrie, just because his numbers are so much better, and they've only lost like two less games than the Celtics. But by the end of the season, I expect Kyrie to be the uh, the the lead in the lead for the MVP, and of course you got guy, you got a guy like Giannis who's you know Giannis and LeBron who are on the back end but because of their team's records, but their stats would definitely make them viable MVP candidates as well. Keep winning if they finish with the best record without Gordon Haywood, Kyrie deserves to get MVP. Uh, but everybody on that team's playing well. I still no disrespect. I, I'm still. I'm not going to make them the favorite in the Eastern Conference. At the beginning of the game, Ernie, I was looking for one thing. I wanted to see if the Celtics would show the, the uh, Golden State Warriors respect, be a little bit scared, be a little bit timid. They were not, and they were playing great defense, but they were shooting 30% from the field. A lot of them shooting 30% in the second half were very low. I knew if they could just you know, keep playing with the same intensity on defense and some of those shots would start falling, they would have a chance. I knew they was going to win that game. What impressed me, Arnie, is, you know, probably when you play Golden State, when you play Houston, you have to pretty much 99% of the time beat them the way they play. 
And let me say this uh, while Kenny Smith is making his point, which is a very good point. I'm looking forward to seeing how Boston plays against the Rockets because the Rockets play an even more extreme version of what Golden State plays as far as jacking up three-point shots. And I'm looking forward to see to seeing how Boston deals with Houston, whether it be in Houston or in, um, in Boston. Because Golden State is a little bit more skillful than Houston and play better defense, but Houston is more physical than Golden State. Harden, Chris Paul, Nene, um, they bring a level of physicality that Golden State doesn't have. So it was, it'll be interesting to see how Boston deals with them. Very rarely can you change the game format on those two teams, especially Golden State, a championship team. They made the format change for Golden State. That was the most impressive thing for me. And Steph Curry and Steve Kerr have created a pace that they make you play at. And Boston said, no, we're not going to play at that pace. And neither are you. That's great. That's what you call great coaching. It's not like Tyron Lue who decided we're going to try to outgun Golden State in last year's finals. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to have my two guys, LeBron and Kyrie, go against your five guys and we're going to outrun and gun you like a fucking idiot. And LeBron James um, still trying to play like he's 21 years old, trying to run up and down the court and then getting burnt out. You know, this is why Steve Kerr respects Brad Stevens. Brad Stevens is going to look at his roster and he's going to say, we're going to we're going to slow this game down. We're going to make it a, you know, a rough and dirty, a rough and dirty game. A lot like going back to my analogy about Ali and Joe Frazier. All right. Joe Frazier made his fights with Ali rough. That's what you have to do in order to win. You. Yeah. That was the most impressive thing. For well, hold on for a second. I think I'm going to throw two stats at you. I'm not a big stat guy. Look at old man Charles with, with his glasses on. Yeah. Listen, Clay and Steph were 8 for 32. That's not going to happen four times in seven games. No disrespect. But also, the, the free throws to me, that was the big difference. The Celtics shot 38. The Warriors only shot 19. But Clay and Steph ain't going to go 8 for 32 that often. Well, a team that shoots 52%. On an average, as the best in the NBA, shoots 40% tonight against the Boston Celtic defense, and they're held to 88 points. And, and Boston did something that oftentimes gets done to Golden State, especially Steph Curry. When you get extremely physical with them, a lot of times they back off and they're not as aggressive. And that's just a personality thing. So Steph Curry has to fight through that. A lot of teams know the book on him is to get extremely physical with him and he'll back off. Points. Now, it was... Uh, in the moments after that game, um, we began hearing a story coming out of Boston concerning Jalen Brown, and uh, the word was that he almost did not play in this game because he lost one of his best friends last night. Uh, Trevin Steed played at uh, Wheeler High School outside Atlanta with Jalen Brown, and uh, so after the game, uh, this was Jalen Brown speaking about that loss. My, uh, my best friend guys last night. Yeah. It was tough uh, to kind of accept it. Everybody was kind of in shock. But, you know, I knew coming in today that he would wanted me to play. I kind of, it was hard getting my thoughts together. But after talking to his mom and his family, it inspired me to come out. And play because I was I was in a, in a shape to come out. I didn't want to leave my room, but uh, they inspired me to come out and play. And I came out and played in the spirit. Today, teammates held me up and we, we pulled it out. Tell us his name. Trevor. Trevor Steve. Okay. Mm. And this was uh, what he posted. Uh, on Twitter after the game. That one was for you, bro. Rest in peace. Uh, there's a video online of those two playing one-on-one -on -one not a long time ago. Wow. And, uh, it's unfortunate. Oh, yeah. And in a way, um, from what I was reading after the game, uh, this was almost one of those situations that Brad Stevens faced last year with Isaiah Thomas and having to talk to a player and saying, do you want to play, you know, or do you, you know, or do you need to sit sit this out and he played tonight and played well was the star of the game yeah. you know it's always a personal decision um, 
uh, you know, you leave that 100% up to the player. Uh, I always played because it, it, you have so much to think about during the game. You do get a little reprieve just during that time period. I agree with that. And uh, I remember I, I got a comment on one of my videos from a brother talking about how he had a fear of death. And, you know, that's a fear that a lot of people often have, not only for themselves, but for their loved ones. Look, the thing about death is that all death is is a, is a transition from the physical world to the spiritual world. It's nothing to be fearful of. It's just a normal process of life. And a lot of times people have a fear of death because they haven't, they haven't been properly taught about the connection between the physical world and the spiritual world. And that natural process is like anything else. It doesn't make any sense to fear things that you cannot change or that you cannot alter. That's why Solomon said that, you know, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. That's just a part of it. There's no need to fear it. You know, we all go through life. We go through trials and tribulations in life. I mean, to be quite honest with you, life is more fearful than death. Because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what type of craziness and nonsense people are going to try to bring your way. What type of negative energy people are going to try to bring your way tomorrow. Or even, even in the next second. You know, all death is, is a release of the soul from the house known as the body. That's it. And you go back and you're at rest to await your judgment. Period. Uh, so, like I said, it's an individual decision. But anytime somebody passed away in, in my life, I needed, instead of just sitting around crying and being depressed, I got on the basketball for, court for a couple hours. And it, and like I say, just for a couple hours, I got a break. You know? And I agree with that. You cannot stop being productive just because of an event like that. Uh, you do need your time to weep or to mourn. You know, the scriptures tell you eight days to weep or mourn. And then after that, you have to carry on and persist on with your life. That's all that you can do. You can't, be cons you can't dwell on things that you cannot change. You certainly cannot go back in the past. And when it comes to things like death, those events are unalterable.